Okay, we are ready to remove the IMA motor from the engine. And there's a special procedure and special tools to do that, special precautions. But before we do that, I wanted to show you the three three-phase cables that come and bolt onto the IMA housing, uh, IMA motor housing itself. Uh, there are three electrical connections there. Let's get those connections undone and get that cable off of there. It's kind of a tight fit. There's a coolant pipe that's right above this and a cover you have to take off and a coolant hose to even get to this. All right, we've got the three bolts out of the electrical connector. Now we've got the U, W, and V cables that have a bolt that hold them to the IMA motor housing. Okay, so now we'll pull straight out, and here are the three wires for the three-phase voltage that drives this IMA motor assembly. Okay, the next step is to remove the flywheel damper assembly. The transaxle that's used with the Honda Civic Hybrid and the Insight and the CRZ and the newer Insight uh, is a continuously variable transmission, a CVT, a belt-driven one. But this is just a torque damper and flywheel assembly. This is not a torque converter. The CVT transmission that's used with, this, with these models had what's called a start clutch that mimicked a torque converter. Uh, but that's inside of the transmission and it had a few problems too. So there are six bolts that hold this flywheel damper assembly to the reluctor wheel on this first generation Honda Civic hybrid engine. I believe it was a 1.4 liter engine. Atkinson cycle which means it's the late intake valve closing engine to reduce pumping losses. This damper assembly is fairly heavy. It is centered on the crankshaft with a little uh, gu guide. So now all the bolts are out of it. It might just fall out, but luckily it's staying in place. And now I'm just going to come in here and grab it and pull it off. As you can see there, there's a big open circle in the middle there that is centered by this piece right here. On this damper, assembly here. I want you to notice I can hold the ring gear for the traditional starter motor that this engine starts with and then it uses this IMA motor to start it after that but notice it has some back and forth play in the damper assembly. Now the the connection from the damper and flywheel assembly to the input shaft of the transmission is just this little tiny hole right here. Zoomed in here you can see that inside of there there are some splines that spline to the input shaft of the transmission. Those splines are about 26, 28 millimeters deep. Should run the full depth of that hole there. Now there have been some problems with those splines stripping out. And when those splines strip out, there's no power flow from the engine to the input shaft of the transmission, and you're just stuck there. And the diagnostic for that is to hook a scan tool up, look at input shaft speed. If it's zero, and your engine speed obviously is not zero, which these two should be the same since they're splined together, then you've got a stripped uh, set of, of teeth there. 
if we look at the CVT transaxle that connects to that flywheel, we can see the splines right there. From what I can tell, this O-ring right here gets cut or damaged during installation. And if this O-ring is damaged, it allows moisture to get up into the splines. And then rust starts to occur. And this input shaft is hardened, but apparently the splines in the uh, flywheel are not hardened the same, and they rust and totally strip out. And when you take one apart that's got stripped out splines, a whole bunch of rust will fall out of the the hole in the flywheel damper assembly, and you'll notice that this O-ring right here is either gone or totally uh, worthless. It's uh, eroded away, broken away, cut, whatever. So when you replace a flywheel that's stripped out, make sure that you replace this O-ring here also to avoid future problems. Okay, the next step in the removal process is to remove the tone ring for the speed sensors. There's three speed sensors right here on this early Civic Hybrid, and this is the tone wheel for that. So we have six 14 millimeter head bolts holding that on. Now this tone wheel is held on both <laughs> magnetically and it's kind of wedged into place. It's a real tight fit. And so it, it may or may not just come off. This centerpiece might. There we go. And this is what centers that flywheel damper to the crankshaft. We'll set this out of the way. You're supposed to make an alignment mark to align the tone wheel to the uh, rotor uh, below it, which we've got a mark already. I'm just going to lightly pry out with this non-pry bar screwdriver. My pry bars are out in the shop, but I'm not going to go get them. Okay. So now here is our tone wheel. If you'll notice on the back here, we have alternating teeth to trip the speed sensors. Okay, now the last part that we are seeing here, there's actually two pieces here. We've got this inner piece that's the rotor that is bolted to the crankshaft of the engine that rotates with the engine. And then around the outside here, we have the individual filled coils for the three-phase uh, voltage. There are 18 of those coils, so every three is connected to a different phase of the three-phase uh, voltage. Uh, one thing I want to point out here on the first generation versus the second and third is the first generation, if we look at the copper wire here, I want you to notice that it's, it's round copper wire on these coils. So they made a change in the second and third generation stators. This, all these copper coils here, that's called the stator. And if we look at the, th the second and third generation stator up on the workbench here, you can see that those are flat cables, flat cables. And by going to flat cables, they were able to add two more rotations or turns per coil and increase the magnetic field strength density. Um, they also bumped the voltage from 144 up to 158. And, and the result is that the second and third generation IMA motor had 50% more power. It had 15 kilowatt of power versus 10 kilowatt on this first generation that we have here on the engine stand. So quite an improvement in performance uh, that was badly needed. But both 
generations of the rotors and stators uh, are removed the, the same way. The second and third generation uh, speed sensors are different, and we'll look at that here in just a moment. Okay, so to remove the rotor assembly, there's a special tool kit. So there's a special tool kit here. It's called the IMA Rotor Remover, and it will pull off using guide pins the rotor itself. And then you can unbolt the stator assembly and the housing that goes with it and take them off separately. Now, I've talked to uh, technicians who have just taken everything off at once. And I said, well, how did you do that? And they said, oh, I just unbolted everything and it came off. Uh, well, <laughs> that's a really bad idea because the rotor that we're, we are going to take off has to be centered on the crankshaft. So unbolting it... Uh, as, as you unbolt it, it becomes off-centered. It'll slap to one side. There's a little bit of an air gap there that can damage the permanent magnets on the first generation one. It can damage the laminated iron plates on the second and third generation ones. That's a, re a really bad idea. And then to put it back together, uh, how are you going to line the bolt holes up when it's off-center? Uh, I'm sure there's some pushing of a bolt while trying to turn it to to get it to uh, line up, but you run a strong risk of, or a, a big risk of cross-threading bolts in the back of the crankshaft uh, of damaging that rotor. So let's go through the removal process using the official tool uh, to do this. All right, the crankshaft bolts are 12-point bolts, so you need a 12-point socket to remove them. We are not going to remove all of them. We are only going to remove three of them. The way you tell which three crankshaft bolts to remove is to take the polar assembly for the rotor itself, which is a very strong uh, permanent magnet assembly, and there's a notch right here in this tool. That notch is designed to clear this little alignment dowel right there. So if we line that up with the alignment dowel and look through the guide pin bolt holes, the big ones on this one, it looks like it's the bolt that lines up with that alignment dowel as the one that that we remove. So in other words, just find the alignment dowel, go to the bolt directly near it, and take it out. Now I've already pre-loosened these, and then we're going to take out every other bolt. So you're taking three bolts out. That way we have three bolts that are still holding the rotor in place and preventing it from getting damaged. All right, then we have three alignment dowels. So these three alignment dowels right here with threaded ends, we're going to thread them into the holes that we just took those bolts out of. These alignment dowels have a 10 millimeter head on the end of them, and we want to use a wrench or socket to run those all the way in. They do not have to be tight, but they do need to be run all the way in so that we are taking advantage of all the threads that are possible. Okay, now that we have those alignment dowels in place, we can take out the other three crankshaft bolts because now the alignment dowels will hold the rotor centered on the crankshaft and prevent it from getting damaged. 
Now you probably just saw right there the rotor tilt just a little bit, but it's still centered. And that's because it's got these super strong permanent magnets. I'm not sure the composition of the magnet, whether they're the neodymium, neodymium magnets or, or not. Okay, so now we come in with our rotor removal tool. We find that notch. We line it up with the guide pin right there. And then we have three bolts that we will bolt into the rotor itself. Get them started by hand first. There we go. And then these bolts don't have to be super tight either. We just run them down until they stop. Just like that. Okay. I forgot one very important step. <laughs> this guide right here uh, is actually a, a protective device that I should have slid in around the rotor assembly before I started to unbolt it. So what we're going to do is take this guide and put it in the air gap and fill up the air gap. Helps to rotate it just a little bit. Just a sheet of paper will do the trick. Okay, notice I've got that in. That guide, that protector, will prevent the magnets from rubbing on the inside of the stator. Uh, on this per first generation, permanent magnets are on the outside of the rotor assembly. And on the second generation one, it'll prevent the laminated iron plates from rubbing on the, the stator assembly. So now we just come in and rotate this handle and keep rotating it clockwise. And notice it will pull out the rotor which if you tried to <laughs> take one of these out without this tool, you would damage the magnets, you would damage the stator. And even more dangerous, if you try to put one of these back together without this guide assembly, you could pinch your fingers. Those magnets are super strong, so as you're there trying to get it back in, it, it might get your fingers caught in there and, and do some severe damage. So we just keep pulling, rotating here, pulling it out. It's getting easier. That means we're clearing the magnetic field's strongest point. And there we go. It's free. Now I just need to reposition myself and just pull that straight back and off. Okay, I've just removed the rotor assembly for the IMA motor. The rotor assembly has the permanent magnets in it. This is the first generation 2003 through 2005 Civic. The one that only had 10 kilowatt of, electric, or of power. And as you can see, these pink magnets around the outside of the rotor assembly are the ones that can get damaged. You should never set this down on something solid. I always set it down in uh, something soft and non-magnetic. Keep it away from metal filings and so on. Uh, I was taught when I went to the Honda training that to just set this in the box that this tool comes with because it's got a big styrofoam um, housing or insert that will hold it in place. So that was removing the rotor. Now we can remove the stator assembly itself. There are four bolts to remove this IMA housing uh, 
two of them are up inside the housing that bolt the housing right to the back of the engine block. And then normally your CVT transaxle would have bolts that would go through all the other bolt holes to hold it in place. But I put two long bolts in there to keep it from falling off. Um, anyway, so let me take those bolts out. This is fairly heavy, so we don't want to just have all that weight held by those two 10 millimeter bolts. Uh, there are guide dowels in the back of this housing, just like this guide dowel right here. So there are two on the other side that'll keep it from dropping as long as you keep pressure holding it up against the back of the engine block. Okay, so this entire housing is free to remove. I'm just going to pull back, have it clear those dowels, clear the guides. Okay, as you can see here, I have the first generation round wire stator assembly. This is from a Honda Civic hybrid, but this could just as easily be the first generation inside. It could be the first generation Honda Accord. They all use this round uh, wire stator. The second and third generation Civic, and I'm sure the, the later model CRZ, the uh, later model Insight, and the 2014 and above Accord are probably all using the, the flat wire system. All right, so that those are the stators. Uh, the speed, speed sensor for the, or sp speed and position sensor for the reluctor on the IMA motor rotor. It's, you've got three speed sensors right here. On the second and third generation motor rotor right here, you can see on the back side, the engine side of the rotor assembly, we have a resolver wheel. And so there's, just like in uh, the Toyotas and Fords and General Motors hybrids, they have a resolver wheel that is used with a special uh, resolver sensor to measure the speed and direction of rotation uh, of and position of the IMA rotor assembly itself. Now this rotor has the magnets inserted inside of all of these little laminated plates. If I zoom it even closer, if you look closely there, you can see all these little lines right there. Those are all steel laminated plates. Um, the magnets are inserted inside of those on the second and third generation uh, IMA systems. The first generation one, as I showed you already, has the magnets on the outside of the rotor, right open and exposed to damage if you were to remove that. We do not want to drag these laminated plates across the laminated plates in the stator assembly. Damage uh, can occur. We always want to use some sort of a sleeve as we pull that off and put it back on. And then of course, to put that rotor back on, we just reverse the the process. It's a fairly easy thing to do if once you have the, the special tool. Once again, just a word of warning, if you do that without the tool, you can either damage the rotor and stator assembly, damage yourself, or who knows, you might get lucky, lucky and not have any trouble at all. But trying to keep that centered on the back of the crankshaft can be quite a, a challenge. Just a couple other things to get finished up here with this Honda video. This IMA system is what is referred to as a parallel hybrid. And a parallel hybrid means that there's some sort of motive force or from an electric motor or whatever, a hydraulic hybrid or whatever it may be, that is helping the crankshaft rotate or helping move the vehicle down the road 
at the same time as the regular internal combustion engine. So this system that bolts right to the crankshaft helps the crankshaft rotate, which makes it get better fuel economy. Um, as you decelerate, it can also uh, give you regenerative braking and slow the vehicle down, depending on the level of regenerative braking. Um, there is no motor-only um, operation without also turning the crankshaft on this on these models. So there is electric vehicle mode only. The VTEC system that's used with the engines on these vehicles can disable uh, up to all of the cylinders to run in electric vehicle mode only for short distances. But by disabling the cylinders, it just leaves the valves closed and it still is turning the crankshaft and having the pistons go up and down in their bore. Uh, so that's a parallel hybrid. It's, it's always helping the crankshaft or the transmission output shaft or the drive shaft. It always is turning with that. Now a series hybrid uh, and a series parallel hybrid are two other types of hybrids that we'll talk about. Uh, the series hybrid would be like a Chevrolet Volt where it has an engine that it runs a generator that then powers an electric motor that runs the vehicle down the road. Uh, later model Honda Accords have a, f a feature very similar to that, a mode similar to that. Uh, all the Toyota and Ford hybrids are a series parallel. So they can either run the vehicle down the road with an electric motor that does not rotate the crankshaft, or uh, they can run the, the vehicle down the road helping or with the assistance of the crankshaft so that's a series parallel so the honda system that came out in 2000 is a parallel hybrid but honda is not the only one that uses this system uh, the, as, a, as a matter of fact the, the prototype of the very first toyota prius uh, clear back in 1995 had a cvt transmission and a ima type motor uh, together with it Toyota still builds a van today, I can't remember the name of it, uh, I'll have to look it up, that uses that same CVT style transmission and an IMA motor and a rear electric motor. So Honda's not the only one doing this. General Motors had a parallel hybrid truck that had a 42 volt uh, <laughs> driven electric motor sandwiched between the engine and the, and the transmission. Uh, the Volkswagens, the Audis, the BMWs, uh, with a few exceptions, um, the Hyundais, the Kias, they all have a, a motor that sandwiches between the internal combustion engine and the transaxle, and they're all parallel hybrids. Um, and there are exceptions to that, but if, if you see just a single electric motor in between the engine and the transmission, it's a integrated motor assist style even though they don't they may not call it that honda was basically the the f one of the first ones to bring it to mass market here in the well was the first one to bring it to mass market in the united states the the toyota van i told you about is just in uh, japan and other uh, parts of the world it's not here in the usa uh, another vehicle that uses this style of motor assist is the eaton medium duty truck hybrid uh, models and then GM and Hyundai and Kia also have what's referred to as a belt alternator starter system where it's an external electric motor bolted to the engine that uses a belt a big seven uh, groove V belt or not V belt serpentine belt uh, to turn the crankshaft in the same manner and assist the crankshaft in the same manner as this system does here uh, Hyundai and Kia have uh, both. They have the one sandwiched between the engine and the transaxle and an external uh, electric motor to, I'm not sure why, uh, probably, well, more efficiency. They, they do very well on their, on their fuel economy. All right, well, this has been a review of a Honda integrated motor assist hybrid system. Honda has newer hybrid systems now that have come out in 2014 on their 
uh, Accord and, and later. They call it their E-Drive system, and it's a really neat system. It uses two electric motors in the transaxle rather than a regular transmission uh, with a motor sandwiched in between it. So Honda's really stepping it up and doing a, a, doing a great job. It's pretty cool. And then the Acura has some amazing uh, hybrids there also, and we don't have time to go into all of that. But I wanted to show you what is what are the basic parts of the Honda IMA system that's been around from the model year 2000 through 2016. So that's 17 years of Honda IMA that's out there uh, to be uh, aware of and, and to be serviced. And then I also wanted you to see what's common between all of these different hybrids. We've got electric motors, we've got the inverters, we've got converters, we've got air conditioning drivers, high voltage batteries, wired in series, contactors, all these things that are common between all the hybrids and many electric vehicles also. So hopefully you're, if you had any fear or apprehension of working on one of these, uh, these videos will help make it a little easier and less uh, worrisome as long as you're following the, the proper service procedures and using the proper uh, special service tools. All right, well, thank you for watching.